Okay, so we left off here where we had an exploit against the server, which crashed at 45, 44, 43, 42. And now we want to look at the um, memory at ESP. And so it's time to talk about what these other panes mean. So here, if I view the log, I've done a little other stuff in the meantime, but up here, yep, here it is. Access violation when executing 45, 44, 43, 42. So let's go back to the, the CPU window, which is the default. All right, now let's talk about these windows. This is the code for the server. It's in assembly language here. Here's the addresses and here's the raw hexadecimal byte. So this is the most difficult to understand unless you know how to read assembler. This is the registers, the same stuff you saw in the GNU debugger with like ESP and EBP and EIP and some other registers that don't matter much to us. This is the stack. So ESP is FF74. It starts at FF74. Here are all the 32-bit words on the stack and it tells you where they go. And the right now at the top of the stack is the return pointer to something in the kernel. And here's something to NTDIL. These are uh, returns to Windows processes that were used to launch this code. And over here is just a place where you can dump any area of memory in hex just to examine it. And that's what we're going to do here. We just had a crash. So I'm going to click the stack pointer and then right click and follow in dump. And down here, I'm not seeing what I expected. So I'm going to run my attack again, debug, restart. Oh, I did a restart during the break. That's what's wrong. So I need to send the attack again. Let me go back to my instructions. The attack that did this was EIP2. So let me clear this and run VS EIP2. Uh, connection ref Oh, I think I didn't restart my server. I did debug restart, but the server is currently paused. I have to run it. There, now I can send this attack. Okay, and now it crashes at 45, 44, 43, 42. So I'm at the point where it crashed, and now I can examine. You can see right here, there's a bunch of Fs right there. And I can examine it in the dump also. Right-click, follow and dump. And you see these Fs. Now, if I scroll up, you'll see this is the data I injected. AAAA, then the BCDE is my instruction pointer, and the ESP is currently pointing right to that F right after the instruction pointer. So I know where to put my exploit code. It's going to be at the stack pointer. The reason I'm doing this is because you cannot turn off Android space layout randomization in Windows. Your program is always being randomly redirected, so you don't know what address to jump to. But I don't need to know because ESP at the point of the crash always points to the first F. So all I need to do is execute a jump ESP. So if I can find a jump ESP somewhere in the Windows code that is not moving, I can exploit it. So let me go back to the instructions. What you do is you use this tool called Mona. By the way, you remember there was an issue of bad characters, things like null bytes and sometimes spaces and tabs have the effect of uh, breaking the string. So there's uh, some steps of instructions here where you actually test all the bad characters. And it turns out in this case, the only bad character is null. And I'm going to skip over that because it's not all that interesting. And then there's Mona. Mona is an add-on to the immunity debugger. You can just add Python scripts in the debugger and you can download it. And Mona is a very powerful reverse engineering tool that can do a lot of great things for reverse engineering. And what we're going to do is we're going to find a module that is not protected in the Windows system. So after you install Mona, all you have to do is download it and drag it into the right folder where Immunity expects modules to be. You can then examine modules at this command, bang Mona modules. And when you do that, it will show you the modules of the currently running system. And here they are. There's uh, different modules here. Um, I think I can make my window wider. I may not be able to in this environment. Maybe I can scroll to the right. Anyway, this is ESS Funk. Here's Moln server itself, and the rest are Windows system modules. And here's what defenses are turned on. The most important one for us is ASLR. If ASLR, address space layout randomization, is turned on, then all those addresses are randomly changed every time it restarts. 
and we can't use it for what we're doing. But there's two modules that don't have ASLR, and those are Veln Server and its DIL file that came with it. Because what happens if you compile it with an old version of Visual Studio, or if you turn off the switches in Visual Studio, you can make code that cannot be relocated. And in that case, it runs legacy code, but it makes your server more vulnerable for running that legacy code that doesn't have the defenses. So we could attack Vuln Server itself, but the problem is Vuln Server loads in low memory at 00400,000. So any address in Vuln Server will have a null byte in it. The first byte is null. But the DIL loaded here up here at 6250 and four zeros. So most of the addresses inside ESS Funk do not have null bytes. So if we can find a jump ESP and null byte in, in ESS Funk, we can go there and that will run the code we inject. And that's what we're going to do. So what you do, there's a Mona command to do that. And um, all right, so you find a jump ESP with Mona. And this is the command, Mona jump minus R ESP minus M. This is find um, a jump to ESP and find it in the module ESSFunks.dil. And you find these addresses, there are something like nine of them because jump ESP is a pretty common assembly language command. So any of those addresses would do. I just used the first one, 6250.11af. That is the address of a jump ESP that's sitting there in memory. And just like in the very first Linux one I showed you, where we executed a win function that the developer put there, we're just going to run that code that this developer put there, but it's going to have unexpected uh, effects. All right. So uh, I think I'll just go to the last result here. Um, you generate exploit code with memsf venom the same way you did before, except now you exclude the null byte. So uh, that's why you execute bad bytes. It's, and you, this is a proper reverse shell, by the way, where the, instead of just opening a listening port, it's going to do what you almost always do in practice. It's going to make an outgoing connection to a server that has to be listening. So I have to generate code with um, the IP address of my command and control center here. So I'm going to do that. Um, it should be in my up arrow list here. I made it during the break, but I forgot to fix the IP address. I need to put in the IP address of my Linux machine. So let me get it. IPA. My Linux machine is this. I'll just copy it if I can get foolish things from to stop happening. All right. There we go. There's the IP address of my Linux machine. So I want to go run this command, and I want to, the IP address of the command and control server has to be in the malware. This is the injected code I'm going to run on the Windows machine. There. Now it's going to go to the Linux machine on port 443. All right. And MSF Phantom is going to give me Python code to put in my exploit. Okay, there it is. Now it's a little bit too big to fit on the screen, so I got to roll back a little. Okay. Now I want to get all this down to there. Okay. Copy. And then I want to put it in my exploit file, which is going to be um, VS shell. All right, you see I've got the old one I put in there with the wrong IP address, which, by the way, is one of the most common mistakes students make. And now I got to get rid of this junk. OK, so what happens is now I'm going to send the prefix, the instruction pointer, and right after that, I'm going to put an op sled and then this buffer and then I'm going to inject the EIP is going to be that address that I got from Mona. I think it's up here. Uh, there it is, 625011AF. That points to a jump ESP. So that should do it. This address is right. This might work. Let's see. Now, it's going to need a listener running. So I have to run this stuff pseudo. I uh, need another tab here. I already, I already do have another tab. Good. Let's go back to this one. 
quit this one. Okay, clear. All right, I'm going to do um, sudo msf console, and you need it this time because I'm trying to listen on port 443, which is a privileged port. So you have to have sudo privileges to do that. All right, um, there we are. Now I just need these, and I think I can dump all these commands in at once. The multi handler, this is a generic payload handler that will just listen on port 443 for any Metasploit malware phoning home. Whoa. Okay, did not get, oh, I didn't get copy. That's right, it's my fault. I tried to copy from my Windows machine or from my Mac. I need to copy from inside the Debian machine. So, there it is. That's the code I want. All right. All right. There we go. Now it is listening. Okay. Now I'm going to make sure my target is ready with debug restart. And run it here. So it is running. And now try sending that exploit from the next tab, which is BS shell. I might have not shimoted it. I didn't shimote it. All right, there. So it sends something, a bunch of things run, a bunch of new threads are launched, but it seems to be working. And if it is working, I would have got a phone home here and I did, my interpreter open. So now I can do um, help or what, get sysinfo, I think, I think. Yep, I now have control of a Windows machine. So those are the steps to do the same thing essentially on the Windows that we did on Linux. Um, and this immunity debugger is a very powerful tool to help you do it. So that's what I wanted to show you about exploiting Windows.